As I said yesterday, the way I'm approaching this is um, actually reducing Lewis's text down to where as much as possible what we're getting is his argument, the way he is thinking through these things. There is uh, quite a bit of content in which I'm not dealing with, but that is why you need to read the book um, and not just listen to me. We looked at the first two broadcast talks that Lewis gave um, that ended up forming this book you have called Mere Christianity. These were brought together eventually in one cover in 1952, published in 1952. The broadcasts, though, were broadcast from 1941 to 1944. Um, this is the third of the broadcasts, and Lewis is now moving from what Christians believe to another dimension of it, Christian behavior. He's talking about Christian morality, the moral and social foundations of Christianity. And in the first talk, which is entitled The Three Parts of Morality, what he's trying to do is first educate his audience as to this topic of morality, how to even approach it. And he breaks it down into three areas. Um, <clears throat> And those areas, as he begins, he says, let's take this a step further. He says, there are two ways in which the human machine goes wrong. One is when human individuals drift apart from one another, or else collide with one another and do damage one to another by cheating or bullying or whatever. The other is when things go wrong inside the individual. When the different parts of him or her, different faculties, desires, either drift apart or interfere with one another. You can get the idea plain if you think of us as a fleet of ships sailing in formation. The voyage will be a success only if in the first place the ships do not collide and get in one another's way. Secondly, if each ship is seaworthy and has her engines in good order. But there is one more thing we have not yet taken into account. We have not asked where this fleet is trying to get to, or what piece of music the band is trying to play. The instruments might all be in tune and might all come together at the right moment, but even so, the performance would not be a success if they had been engaged to provide dance music and actually played nothing but dead marches. And however well the fleet sailed, its voyage would be a failure if it were meant to reach New York and actually arrived at Calcutta. Morality, he goes on to say, seems to be concerned with these three things. Firstly, with fair play and harmony between individuals. Secondly, with what might be called tidying up or harmonizing the things inside each individual. And thirdly, the general purpose of human life as a whole what a person was made for, what course the whole fleet ought to be on, what tune the conductor of the band wants to play. So he's breaking down morality in these three areas. When you begin to talk about it, you have to talk about our relationship with one another, but also our relationship to ourselves. And then as a community, where we're going. Morality that applies to the entire community. He goes on, second point, what is the good of telling the ships how to steer so as to avoid collisions if in fact they are such crazy old tubs that they cannot be steered at all? And now here's pointing about the importance of the inside. What is the good of drawing up on paper rules for social behavior if we know that in fact our greed, cowardice, ill temper, self-conceit are going to prevent us from keeping them? You cannot make men good by law. And without good men, you cannot have a good society. That is why we must go on to think of the second thing, of morality inside the individual. To get them in proper working order so that they can properly relate to those outside, so that the fleet can get to where it's supposed to be going. He goes on, but I do not think we can stop there either. We are now getting to the point at which different beliefs about the universe lead to different behavior, different moralities. 
as it were. <clears throat> Remember that religion involves a series of statements about facts, which must be either true or false. If somebody else made me for his own purposes, then I shall have a lot of duties which I should not have if I simply belonged to myself. If Christianity is true, then the individual is not only more important, but incomparably more important, for he is everlasting, and the life of a state or a civilization compared with his is only a moment. Now Lewis makes a lot of this, not only here, but in his sermon, The Weight of Glory, and in some other essays. When he begins to talk about morality, and he begins to talk about Christian morality, the fact that Christians believe that humans, all humans, are immortal, sets them above all other things. As he says, nations, civilizations, their life is like the life of a gnat. They're here and they're gone, but human beings continue forever. And therefore, their existence is more important. And it is at that point in his sermon, The Weight of Glory, he leads us to an understanding that there are no ordinary people. As he says, you've never met a mere mortal in your life. Immortals, potential gods and goddesses, are the people that we, he says, live with, snub, exploit. He says, it seems then that if we are to think about morality, we must think of all three departments. Relations between people, things inside each person, and the relations between a person and the power that made him. It is in dealing with the third that the main difference between Christian and non-Christian morality comes out. That is, this relationship with the one who tells us what morality really is. For the rest of this book, I'm going to assume the Christian point of view and look at the whole picture as if it will be, um, a, as if Christianity is true. In the second lecture, that's how we finished the first one, the first talk, the second one in this series called The Cardinal Virtues, he says, I want to now look at morality and break it down in another way. You can break it down in, in terms of the way I did in the first lecture, but he says there's another way. In accordance to this longer scheme, there are seven virtues. And now he's tying into a long-standing tradition of how we approach morality. Four of them, he says, are called cardinal virtues, and the remaining three are called theological virtues. The cardinal ones are those which all civilized people recognize. The theological are those which, as a rule, only Christians know about. I shall deal with the theological ones later, and that's at the end. At present, I'm talking about the four cardinal virtues. These were card called cardinal virtues because they are, as we should say, pivotal. And they are prudence, temperance, justice, fortitude. Prudence means common sense. Taking the trouble to think out what you are going to do and what is likely to come of it. Not just what to do, but the outcome. Jesus told us to be not only as harmless as doves, but also as wise as serpents. He wants a child's heart, but a grown-up's head. He wants us to be simple, single-minded, affectionate, and teachable as good children are. But he also wants every bit of intelligence we have to be alert at its job and in first-class fighting trim. Remember, last night in the lectures before, Christians view the world as a place that is at war. Temperance is unfortunately one of those words that has changed in its meaning, he says. It now usually means teetotalism, abstaining completely from drink. Temperance referred not specially to drink in its original sense, but to all pleasures, temperance to all pleasures, and it did not mean abstaining, but going the right length and no further. The whole point is that if one does abstain, 
and there's reason for it, and he goes into it, it's for a good reason. An individual Christian may see fit to give up all sorts of things for special reasons. Marriage, or meat, or beer, or the cinema. But the moment he starts saying that these things are bad in themselves, or looking down his nose at other people who do use them, he, began, he is beginning to take a wrong turn. He moves to justice. Justice means much more than the sort of thing that goes on in law courts. It is the old name for everything we should now call fairness, and it includes honesty, give and take, truthfulness, keeping the promises, and all that side of life. And fortitude, the last one, includes both kinds of courage, the kind that faces danger, as well as the kind that sticks it under pain. Now this is an old Britishism. In other words, is able to keep up under pain and continue to do the right thing. Guts he calls it, is perhaps the nearest modern English equivalent. You will notice, of course, that you cannot practice any of the other virtues, prudence, temperance, justice, very long without bringing this one into play, fortitude. Because what this one does is it allows you to sustain your ability to practice these other virtues under adverse circumstances. There is one further point about the virtues that ought to be noticed, he goes on to observe. There is a difference between doing some particular just or temperate action and being a just or temperate person. What you mean by a good player, a tennis player, is a person whose eye and muscles and nerves have been so trained by making innumerable good shots that they can now be relied on. They have a certain tone or quality which is there even when he, he is not playing. In the same way, a person who perseveres in doing just actions gets in the end a certain quality of character. Now it is that quality rather than the particular action which we mean when we talk about virtue in the Christian sense. So it's a deeper thing for the Christian. It's not merely doing the action, but it's actually becoming that action. It, it, it defines who you are. And this distinction is important, he says, for the following reasons. If we thought only of the particular actions, we might be encouraged to think three wrong ideas. And the first one, he says, we might think that provided you did the right thing, it did not matter how or why you did it. Whether you did it willingly or unwillingly, sulkily or cheerfully, through fear of public opinion or for its own sake. But the truth is that right actions done for the wrong reason do not help to build the internal quality or character called virtue. And it is this quality or character that really matters to God. Secondly, we might think that God wanted simply obedience to a set of rules. Whereas he really wants people of a particular sort. Again, going back to this quality. That you just don't do temperate things on occasion, but you are a temperate person. You're a prudent person. It defines who you are. And lastly, we might think that the virtues were necessarily only for this life, this present life. And Lewis goes on to note that no, these are going to define the life to come. And that is how he ends the second broadcast talk. He begins now from moving from this broad discussion of morality to beginning to focus more and more on particular things. So he moves in, and it's still a little more general, but he talks about social morality, that is morality among humans. And the first things to get clear about Christian morality between man and man is that this department, Christ did not, in this department, Christ did not come to preach any brand new morality. That might sound a bit shocking. But he says the golden rule of the New Testament, do as you would be done by, is a, is a, a summing up of what everyone at bottom had always known to be right. You go to Confucianism, you have the same sort of principle. The second thing to get clear is that Christianity has not and does not profess to have a detailed political program for applying. 
And the reason is, is because it is to be applied to all. To all nations, to all communities, to all civilizations. It is met at, uh, for all men at all times and the particular program which suited one place or time would not suit another. And anyhow, that is not how Christianity works. When it tells you to feed the hungry, it does not give you lessons um, in cookery. And when it tells you to read the scriptures, it not, does not give you lessons in Hebrew or Greek or even English grammar. It was never intended to replace. This is what the important point is for him. It was never intended to replace or supersede the ordinary human arts and sciences. It is rather a director which will set them all to the right jobs and a source of energy which will give them all new life if only they will put themselves at its disposal. In other words, the, this morality that Christianity gives, we need to take and integrate into the particulars of our life. It doesn't do it for you. That's why Lewis is always banging on the fact that Christians ought to be thinking people. Not lazy in that way. And that takes hard work to know how to integrate those things. And if I can put a plug in, and I know now that Tom Terrence is going to rise up and call me blessed for this, but um, the Fellows Program is all about that, folks. Um, how to take these, these principles and begin to flesh them out into everyday life. The other thing, he sums up a, a, a number of things um, in this area. The, the, the need for obedience in this area. He goes on and he talks, and I'm not going to go into this, but you need to look at it. He makes the observation that up until modern times, lending money at interest was always viewed as a vice. And it's probably worth at least looking at what he has to say there. He also has a section on charity, giving to the poor, and his notion of giving. Now, I will just tell you this, when you read this, I just want you to know that most all of his income, if not all of it, from his books went to charity. He just lived on his stipend at Oxford, which was not very much. He was always afraid of going broke. So when he says what he does on charity, he's not just blowing gas, as he would put it, another Britishism. He really means it. He begins to finish up, though, and I want to read this bit. Most of us are not really approaching the subject in order to find out what Christianity says. That is, coming and saying, what does Christianity say about my relationship with another, myself, and God? He says, we are approaching it in the hope of finding support from Christianity for the views of our own party. I am just the same. A Christian society is not going to arrive until most of us really want it. And we are not going to want it until we become fully Christian. I may repeat, do as you would be done by, till I am black in the face. But I cannot really carry it out till I love my neighbor as myself. And I cannot learn to love my neighbor as myself till I learn to love God. And I cannot learn to love God except by learning to obey Him. And so, as I warned you, we are driven on to something more inward, driven on from social matters to religious matters, for the longest way round is the shortest way home. We have to begin to give attention to this inner person. And he moves on then to a chapter he calls Morality and Psychoanalysis, where he's using psychoanalysis in this area in terms of psychology, this idea of looking at the health, the well-being of the inner person. He says, I have said that we should never get a Christian society unless most of us become Christian individuals. That does not mean, of course, that we can put off doing anything about society until some imaginary date in the far future. It does mean that we must begin both jobs at once. The job of seeing how do as you would be done by can be applied in detail to modern society, but also the job of becoming the sort of people who really would apply it if we saw how. 
Now I want to begin considering what the Christian idea of a good person is, the Christian specifications for the human machine. And he begins this way, imagine three men who go to war. One has the ordinary natural fear of danger that any man has and he subdues it by moral effort and he becomes a brave person. Let us suppose that the other two have, as a result of things in their subconsciousness, exaggerated, irrational fears, which no amount of moral effort can do anything about. Now suppose that a psychoanalyst comes along and cures these two of these phobias, these issues, and he puts them both back in the position of the first man, who's able, you know, to allow moral understanding to put his fears in order. Well, it is just then that his psychoanalytical problem is over and the moral problem, that is the real moral problem, begins. The first might say, thank goodness I've got rid of all those doodahs. Now at last I can do what I always wanted to do, my duty to the cause of freedom. I'm able to master my fears and get the job done. Indeed, one of the good things about feeling less frightened is that I can now look after myself much more efficiently and can be much cleverer at hiding the fact from the others. Now this, is the di this difference is a purely moral one and psychoanalysis cannot do anything about it. However much you improve the man's raw material, you have still got something else, the real free choice of the man on the material presented to him, either to put it to his advantage first or to put it his advantage last. And this free choice is the only thing that morality is concerned with. Now he goes on, and I'm going to take some time on this one because, again, I think this is important, some of his insights. He's talking about raw material, and I think within the Christian community we have some misconceptions here. He says, can we be quite certain, can we, you, how we should have behaved if we had been saddled with the psychological outfit, with this same psychological outfit, and then with a the bad upbringing, and then with the power, say, of Hemmler. If we had all of their background and upbringing, can we predict how we would respond? That is why Christians are told not to judge. We see only the results which a man's choices make out of his raw material. But God does not judge him on the raw material at all but on what he has done with the raw material. Most of the man's psychological makeup is probably due to his body, and when his body dies, all that will fall off. And the real central man, the thing that chose, that made the best or worst out of this material will stand naked. All sorts of nice things which we thought our own, which were really due to good digestion, for example, will fall off some of us and all sorts of nasty things which were due to complexes or bad health will fall off others. And we shall then for the first time see everyone as he really was and there will be surprises. Now let me give you an example. My wife's grandmother who I met um, you know when we first got married and, and, and I just I loved this woman. She was the sweetest woman you could ever meet in your life. And in her late 80s, there was this major change, and I'm just glad I never saw it. I just like to remember her the way she was. She just turned into the wicked witch of the East. To the point she, where she even tried to bite, at times, my mother-in-law. Now what's happened? That sweet person, I think, is still there, but the raw material, something went wrong and imprisoned that. And they weren't in sync anymore. The inside, something had broken down. And this is what Lewis is talking about. You have both of these. And so he moves on and tries to qualify this even more. He says, people often think of Christian morality as a kind of bargain in which God says, if you keep a lot of rules, I will reward you. And if you don't, I'll do the other thing. I would much rather say that every time you make a choice, you are turning the central part of you, the part of you that chooses, into something a little different from what it was before. With all your innumerable choices, 
All your life long you are slowly turning this central thing, who you really are, either into a heavenly creature or into a hellish creature. Either into a creature that is in harmony with God or with other creatures and with itself or itself into one that is in a state of war and hatred with God and with its fellow creatures and even with itself. To be the one kind of creature is heaven, to be the other means madness, horror, idiocy, rage, impotence, and eternal loneliness. Each of us at each moment is progressing to one state or the other, and some very slowly and some more quickly, depending on the choices. And that explains what always used to puzzle me about Christian writers. They seem to be so very strict at one moment and so very free and easy at, the, at another. They talk about mere sins of thought as if they were immensely important. And then they would talk about the most frightful murders and treacheries as if it, it had only got to be repented of and would be forgiven. But I have come to see that they were right. What they are always thinking of is the mark which the action leaves on that tiny central self which no one sees in this life, but which each of us will have to endure or enjoy forever. Each of them, if he seriously turns to God, can have that twist in the central man straightened out again. Each in the long run, doomed if he will not. The bigness or smallness of the thing seen from the outside is not what really matters. When a man is getting better, he understands more and more clearly the evil that is still left in him. When a man is getting worse, he understands his own badness less and less. A moderately bad man knows he's not very good. A thoroughly bad man thinks he's all right. Good people know about both good and evil. Bad people do not know about either. Now the point here to just to leave you with, which is important, is that for Lewis, his understanding is all these little decisions leave these marks and they're cumulative. And if they are slowly moving in the direction away from God, they will mark this individual and they will make them of a different quality than if you're moving towards God.